Our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Paul Helft. Um, Paul is the, um, um, the director uh, of the Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics and an associate professor of medicine at Indiana University. Uh, Paul is a member of the Ethics Committee there and co-chairs the Ethics Consultation Subcommittee. Um, Paul completed you did your bachelor's here too. Oh yes, I thought so. His bachelor's degree, his medical degree, his residency in internal medicine, his fellowships in hematology and oncology, and his fellowship in clinical medical ethics at the University of Chicago. <laughs> Paul, welcome. Thanks. Welcome back. Thank you very much. It's really fun to be back. So thanks to Mark and to the whole and to the whole center. Um, and congratulations on all the obvious accomplishments. Um, I noticed that just in my own session here, session two, um, Lynn Jansen was a, a classmate of mine from fellowship. Alexia is one of my uh, closest colleagues. David Rubin was one year ahead of me in both medical school and in residency. And Ellen was uh, either a senior fellow or a junior faculty member when I was in medical school here, so the connections go deep. Um, Th this is on the on the subject of random topics. Um, this talk is a, a set of opinions uh, I I've uh, come to over the course of the past one or two years watching a number of mostly regulatory efforts, including in my own state of Indiana, to impose the use of opiate uh, care contracts uh, for patients receiving opiates for. Uh, uh, not mostly for non-malignant pain, although there have been many discussions about uh, populations to involve. And so, um, just briefly in, in terms of background, uh, r what I'm going to call written behavioral agreements uh, were actually first used in the late 1960s in the context of no suicide contracts, as they were called at the time. Um, and then since that time, they've uh, developed a, a utility in psychiatry and in pain medicine and in addiction medicine. And the recent, uh, what has been called an epidemic, uh, which I think probably could be described truly as an epidemic of harms from prescription medications, mainly opiates, have made them more popular. And as I mentioned, many state regulations have begun uh, to require them. Um, so just to convince you how serious the problem is, the number of deaths from unintentional drug overdoses has been rising steadily for two straight decades. It's now the second leading cause of accidental deaths in the U.S., and overdoses of opiates now outnumber those of heroin and cocaine combined. Um, and I think very importantly, the toll that this takes not just on uh, patients and families, but on uh, providers who interact with what I think can only be described as this extraordinarily challenging and uh, difficult group of patients leads to a great deal of uh, frustration. So ask any primary care internist uh, or uh, resident in a resident internal medicine clinic and this becomes a, a, a real major issue. So I just want to acknowledge that I recognize that. So here's the argument that I'm going to try to make to you over the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to argue that opiate uh, written behavioral agreements should be abandoned. Um, the, the argument uh, flows from three contentions that, again, I'll try to convince you of. The first, that there's no compelling evidence that they achieve their desired outcomes, that is, they're ineffective. Uh, number two, that they're analogous to adhesion contracts in the law, uh, that is, that they're unfair, lopsided, and might be described legally as, if they were legal documents, as unconscionable. And that finally, they fundamentally alter the doctor-patient relationship in harmful ways. So uh, again, the, 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 these written behavioral agreements started life as contracts, and when people became uncomfortable uh, with the term contract, recognizing that they were in no way actual legal contracts, uh, came up with the term agreements. And I'm just going to use the term written behavioral agreements, which is not in the literature, but which is a term that I've invented uh, because I think they best describe what they actually are. Um, so let's talk about the effectiveness of opioid uh, written behavioral agreements. So the goal of these uh, agreements purportedly is to increase adherence to the medications. And I'll just review the literature with you about uh, what the outcome studies show. The Cochrane Collaboration did a review published in 2009 looking at 30 randomized controlled trials in the, in the areas that you could read there and concluded that there was not enough evidence available to recommend the routine use of contracts in health services to improve patients' adherence. And Starles did uh, a review, the largest review that I know of, 
uh, looking at um, uh, uh, pain, looking at this issue in pain management, found, looking at 11 studies, they were all of sort of fair to poor quality and found only relatively weak evidence that supporting their effectiveness in reducing opioid misuse. These are two smaller studies uh, from 1995, a small retrospective observational study uh, found uh, a small positive effect on adherence, but actually when you look carefully at the study, there were no explicit outcome criteria defined in the study, so it's very hard to know what they actually meant. And finally, in 1996, this case series of 20 uh, uh, cases of patients with non-malignant pain and, a history, and actually a history of substance abuse and found no correlation between assigned uh, agreement and subsequent abuse. Uh, so difficult to uh, draw conclusion, conclusions from such small studies. Um, but again, I haven't been able to review all the, me the many studies that have now been reviewed in the Cochrane Review, but uh, I would argue that the conclusion that we can draw from a broad level are that no high quality data exists to support such widespread use and endorsement by practicing clinicians, by professional societies now, or regulatory bodies. So some have tried to argue that these documents are not actually contracts or agreements. What they actually are is informed consent documents or educational documents, that is, they serve those functions instead. And I won't belabor with this audience the four elements of informed consent, but this is the largest uh, review that I know of looking at uh, pain documents uh, from 39 major academic centers uh, in which the authors analyzed every statement that was contained within the documents and grouped them into 12 major categories based on their frequency. And, and if you just read through the list, what you find is that 90% uh, of the documents contained the terms of treatment, prohibited behaviors, points of termination, and so on and so forth. Again, I won't read the list, but um, I think it's fair to say that hardly any of these pertain directly to either education or to informed consent. Now I want to turn to, as many of you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I want to turn, I, th I think it's important because these uh, documents started life as contracts to conceive of them for a moment as contracts and, and see what that outcome would be if you, if you used a legal analysis to, uh, as a lens. Um, so these are clearly not bind legally binding contracts, uh, nor is it likely that they were ever actually managed to function at, at, at such. However, I would contend that proponents of these documents believe that they must serve at least several of one uh, uh, pseudo-legal functions. Uh, they might be uh, serving to make pa patients' obligations of the patient explicit, to specify the consequences of non-adherence, to allow a pre-specified means of exiting the relationship, or to provide some protection from legal risk. Um, these uh, documents may actually, in that respect, uh, more closely resemble adhesion contracts rather than legitimate contracts. And I won't re re read to you the Black's Law Dictionary but, uh, definition of this, but I think the important parts of it are that uh, the party signing it is in a weaker position. Usually a consumer has little choice about the terms, which is generally uh, universally true about signing uh, opiate pain contracts. So if they were contracts, they would probably be uh, unenforceable because they would meet the legal definition of unconscionable. That is, uh, leading to an absence of meaningful choice on the part of one of the parties together with contract terms which are unreasonably favorable to the other party. And so I conclude from this that they are both unconscionable and unfair, analogous to illegitimate adhesion contracts because they force patients to sign them under duress with a lopsided set of expectations and requirements. And they may or may not provide any legal protection by virtue of their role in documenting attempts to control patients' behaviors. This, this latter issue has not been well studied at all. So turning to the third point that I tried to make, uh, am trying to make, the ethical risks of written behavioral agreements. Um, uh, Payne wrote in 2010 uh, that the main function of uh, these documents appears to be to control or modify a patient's behavior. And in fact, in Fishman's review article that I just cited to you, nine of the top ten most frequently identified statements in the contracts analyzed uh, were statements requiring specific behaviors of patients. So what effect do these have on the doctor-patient rela relationship? Well, with their legalistic and sometimes punitive language, they're likely, I would argue, to undermine trusting doctor-patient relationships, um, and in fact may uh, indeed transmogrify core elements of the relationship which contribute to trusting relationships. Think of uh, William May's uh, idea of, the, uh, of, a, of uh, the relationship as a covenant, and you'll see that uh, you know, a document that tries to outline this part of it uh, doesn't fit into that well at all. So you might ask, what is the real purpose of these documents then? Um, and so I, I've come to the conclusion that the real unstated purpose of these documents is actually to provide a defensible exit strategy 
for, for, from, from the relationships, which again, I, uh, I don't want you to think I don't understand, uh, represent some of the most challenging and difficult patients in any medical setting. So patients with chronic non-malignant pain, patients with addiction and severe behavioral uh, issues, et cetera. And, but, and so reliance on these documents represents an abdication of our deepest ethical commitments. It may be easier to use these documents as a grounds for patients uh, for dismissal than it is to provide long-term, seemingly ineffective, frustrating, challenging, interminable care to difficult patients. Uh, but again, I would argue that they, they do the kind of damage that does not justify their uh, use in existence. So in conclusion, you might ask, what are the alternatives then if, I, if, I, if I'm arguing for abandonment of the documents themselves? Well, I think we go back to the, four, the core fundamentals of the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, to include caring, open, and I'm not saying this is easy, by the way, caring, open, honest, and compassionate communication, detailed informed consent processes, which are then carefully and extensively documented in discussions. Good luck with all that, right? Setting limits, even including refusals to provide certain requested treatments uh, without, uh, that don't rely on a contractual basis and the ongoing provision and promise of uh, care clinical encounters and even alternative therapies uh, that is an ongoing relationship um, uh, which may or may not include prescri the prescription of opiates in that relationship. Thank you. Four and a half minutes. Great. There, there, there's time for questions um, for Paul. Um, yes, please. Oh, wait. wait. Oh, I see a lot of hands up. There's one over here okay. first, Mark. Elizabeth, and then over there. Go ahead. Those are really good questions. Briefly, I mean, I, I, I think this paper actually started life as an argument about all written behavioral agreements, including no suicide contracts. There are even better data to suggest that those are not effective. Um, so it, it's, it's very true, and I think two things are at work in, your, in the first part of your question. Um, one is that we you know, have an inadequately trained, uh, you know, as a primary care group, as those uh, specialists who deal with patients with respect to difficult psychiatric and behavioral issues. And the second is we come to it with a great set of biases actually against both addiction, and, addiction behaviors and then difficult patient behaviors, uh, et cetera. So those, I mean, those two, I think, both have a profound effect on, on the problem. We're going to take three short questions. Um, I, I see three people over. standing up. Okay. Um, and then give Paul the chance to answer all three. Uh, Dan. Yeah, Dan Bronner. Um, nice talk, Paul. I, I agree with you. You were my attending, remember? Yep. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so, um, I think you bring up a great point, and it seems, you know, we don't have those contracts here, but we have other ways in which the government is trying to make it more and more difficult to prescribe uh, opiates. You know, you have to have a handwritten thing. If you want um, a long-term chronic use covered by IDPA, you have to check a box that says the patient has a pain contract. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> um, I haven't yet. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh, may I will in the future. Um, but. It seems that these things are not really directed at sort of improving the patient's lot in life, that it's just ways of getting in the way of prescribing the, uh, the drugs, and that those, they're really a subterfuge to the government's um, plan, which I think it's important. I think people are using um, pain medicines at this point in ways that are, you know, they're way over-prescribed now, especially in emergency rooms, for some patients, obviously, who use, um, that people are using sort of a hospice model with patients with chronic care. But I think part of the issue here is that they don't really care that much that they're effective for patient care. They're, they're, they're just roadblocks to, to getting a prescription to the patient. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ellen, a brief question. Hi, Ellen. Um, my question relates to um, your recommendation about informed consent. We actually have been dealing with this for years and I think finally may have solved it, although the new policy hasn't come out. But you know what I'm advocating for is we're actually going to ban uh, pain care agreements and require written informed consent, um, very similar to your recommendation. But I wanted to um, ask about, you know, you, you suggest that it relates to an exit strategy. And, it, and actually, in our system, there is no exit strategy, right? It's not, that's, yeah. that's clearly not the intent because we can't fire patients. Um, and so it's much more about um, a belief, I think, that it improves safety. 
which there is no evidence for. Um, and, and so I was wondering, you know, I was thinking of a variety of questions, but my main question is, um, you know, what we ended up with in informed consent was language about the limits. And patients have to say the language is, I have read this patient education brochure about safety, and I intend to do what it says in there. And that is as far as we go. Yeah. And I was wondering what you would think about well, that. Well, I would just ask you a simple question. Who is that document for? It's clearly an education document. Yes, no, it's, it's very patient-friendly it, education document. No, it's clearly to, for the institution and the practitioners and to, 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 give, no, I to disagree. protect them. I disagree. We have written informed consent <laughs> for many, many, many things that you probably don't, and we use it but purely as education. But your informed consent documents don't, lim don't, don't set a limit. They, yeah, they do. I, I would say they do because they um, they clarify um, what you're expected to do and, and the consequences if you don't do those things. It's an educational piece, right? So if you, I, we could get in a whole debate about this, but if you, if it's unsafe, I, <laughs> if it's unsafe, I think you need to inform people. That I have no unsafe. problem with providing educational documents. Good. But turning them into, <laughs> you know, so-called sort of enforceable agreements is where, that's where I'm, yeah. I've got I would argue that ours isn't, but I, th I think you might think it is. <laughs> yeah, I think we do. Well, I, I, I would agree that the relationship is, what I'm arguing is that the relationship and the standard practices within the relationship are sufficient. Okay. That this is actually a, a net harm on the relationship. That kind of goes with what I was going to say in that briefly, pushing back against Ellen a little bit, there is a time when therapeutic doctor-patient relationships are relationships, and there may come a time when that relationship is no longer therapeutic or functional, when certain uh, uh, lines have been crossed, whether deception or mutual or unilateral deception. So um, certainly those lines can be crossed. Perhaps these documents, I would agree with you, are not a way to measure whether or not that line has been crossed. Good. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs>